600 is close enough to 500 to lie within the uncertainty of our knowledge of the size of the resource. So with that observation, that is a correct statement. At present rates, meaning zero growth, we have enough coal for around 600 years. The whole point of the story that this led into was that we have to have rapid growth in coal consumption in the United States. Now it's obvious, isn't it, if you have the growth they're writing about, it won't last as long as they said it would last with zero growth. They never mentioned this. I wrote them a long letter, told them I thought this was a serious misrepresentation to give the readers the feeling that we can have all the growth that they're writing about and still have coal around for 650 years. I got back a nice form letter. It had nothing to do with what I'd tried to explain to them. I gave this talk at a high school in Omaha, and after the talk, the high school physics teacher came to me, and he had a booklet. He said, have you seen this? I hadn't seen it. He said, look at this. We've got coal coming out of our ears. As reported by Forbes magazine, now that's a prominent business magazine, the United States has 437 billion tons of known coal reserves. That is a good figure. This is equivalent to a lot of BTUs, or it's enough energy to keep 100 million large electric generating plants going for the next 800 years or so. Now the teacher said to me, how can that be true? That's one large electric generating plant for every two people in the United States. I said, of course it can't be true. It's absolute nonsense. Let's do long division to see how crazy it is. So you take the coal they say is there, divide by what was then the current rate of consumption, you find you couldn't keep that rate up for 800 years. We hardly have 500 large electric generating plants. They said it would be good for 100 million such plants. Time magazine tells us, than beneath the pits heads of Appalachia and the Ohio Valley and under the sprawling strip mines of the West lie coal seams rich enough to meet the country's power needs for centuries no matter how much energy consumption may grow. And so I give you a very fundamental observation. Don't believe any prediction of the life expectancy of a non-renewable resource until you have confirmed the prediction by repeating the calculation. As a corollary, we have to note that the more optimistic the prediction, the greater is the probability that it's based on faulty arithmetic or on no arithmetic at all. Again from Time magazine, energy industries agree that to achieve some form of energy self-sufficiency, the U.S. must mine all the coal that it can. Now think about that for just a moment. Let me paraphrase it. The more rapidly we consume our resources, the more self-sufficient we'll be. Now, isn't that what it says? Well, David Brower called this the policy of strength through exhaustion. <laughs> now, here's an example of strength through exhaustion. Here is William Simon, energy advisor to the President of the United States. Simon says we should be trying to get as many holes drilled as possible to get the proven oil reserves. The more rapidly we can get the last of that oil up out of the ground and finish using it, the better off we'll be. Well, let's look at Dr. Hubbard's graph for oil production in the lower 48 states. There was a long period of approximately steady growth indicated by this straight line on the semi-logarithmic plot. But for quite a while now, production has fallen below the growth curve while our demand continued on up this growth curve until the 1970s. Now, it's obvious the difference between those two curves has to be made up with imports. And it was in early 1995 that the news told us that the year 1994 was the first year in our nation's history in which we had to import more oil than we were able to get out of our own ground. Well, maybe you're wondering, does it make any sense to imagine that we could have steady growth in the rate of consumption of a resource till the last bit of it was used and then the rate of consumption would plunge abruptly to zero? I say, no, that does not make sense. You say, all right, why bother us then with the calculation of this expiration time? My answer is this. Every segment of our society, our business leaders, government leaders, political leaders, the local level, state level, national level, everyone aspires to maintain a society in which all measures of material consumption continue to grow steadily year after year after year, world without end. Now, since that's so central to everything we do, we ought to know where it would lead. On the other hand, we should recognize there is a better model. We turn again to the work of the late Dr. Hubbard. 
He has plotted the rate of consumption of resources that have already expired. He finds, yes, there is an early period of steady growth in the rate of consumption, but then the rate goes through a maximum and comes back down in a nice symmetric bell-shaped curve. And when he fitted this curve to the data on U.S. oil production back in the 1970s, he found that at that point we were right about there. We were one halfway through that enormous resource. Now that's roughly what that Texas expert said in the quotation we saw earlier. Now let's see what it means. It means that from now on, domestic oil production can only go downhill, and it's downhill all the rest of the way. And it doesn't matter what they say inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Now it means we could work hard and put some bumps on the downhill side of the curve. You'll see there are bumps on the uphill side. The debate is heating up over drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. I've seen the estimate that they might find 3.2 billion barrels of oil up there. 3.2 billion is the area of that little tiny square that's less than one year's consumption in the United States. Now, let's look at the curve in this way. The area under the entire curve represents the entire resource of U.S. petroleum before any of it was used. Now, that area has been divided here into three parts. Unshaded on the left, that's the oil we've taken from the ground. We've used it. It's gone. This vertical shaded band, that's the oil we've drilled into. We've found it. We're pumping on it today. Shaded in green on the right is the undiscovered oil. We have very good ways now of estimating how much oil remains undiscovered. This is the undiscovered oil. This is the oil we're looking for in all those places where drilling is going on. This is the oil we've got to find if we're going to make it down the curve on schedule. Now, every once in a while, someone reminds me that 100 years ago, someone did a calculation and predicted that the U.S. would be out of oil perhaps in 25 years. We obviously were not. The calculation must have been wrong. Therefore, of course, all calculations are wrong. Well, now let's understand what they did 100 years ago. This band of discovered oil 100 years ago was way over in here someplace. At that point, they had no idea how much oil was undiscovered. So they just took the discovered oil, divided by how rapidly it was then being consumed, come up with 25 years. Now, it's clear you have to make a new calculation every time you make a new discovery. We're not asking today how long will the discovered oil last. We're asking about the discovered and the undiscovered. We're now asking about the rest of the oil. And what does the Geological Survey tell us? Back in 1984, they said that the estimated supply in the U.S. from undiscovered resources and demonstrated reserves is 36 years at present rates of production or 19 years in the absence of imports. Five years later, in 1989, that 36 years is down to 32 years. The 19 years is down to 16 years. So the numbers are holding together as we march down the right-hand side of the Hubbard curve. So maybe you're wondering, well, why didn't somebody tell us this? It was back in 1956. Dr. Hubbard addressed a convention of petroleum geologists and engineers. He told them that his calculations led him to conclude that the peaks of U.S. oil and gas production that you just saw can be expected to occur between 1966 and 1971. No one took him seriously. So let's see what's happened. The data here are from the Department of Energy. So this is U.S. oil production. We see a long period of approximately steady growth. Here's the year 1956 when Dr. Hubbard did his analysis, and he said at that time that the peak would occur between 1966 and 1971. Well, the peak occurred in 1970. It was followed by a very rapid decline. Then the Alaska pipeline started delivering its first oil, and there was a partial recovery. That production has now peaked, and everything's going downhill in unison. And when I go to a spreadsheet on my computer at home, and I find the parameters of the curve that is the best fit to these scattered U.S. data, from that best fit curve, it looks to me as though we have consumed three-quarters of the recoverable oil that was ever in our